What if we as a society are not using music to its full potential? What if the full potential of music reaches far beyond that which we use it today? My name is Dr. David Greenberg, and I'm a neuroscientist, psychologist, and also a musician. And together with colleagues from around the world, we have been dedicating time and effort into over uncovering the greater potential of music and how it can address many of the social issues that we face today as a society. We started a new initiative called One World in Song. This initiative is bringing together world-renowned musicians together with expert scientists to find real world applications for music that can build community, build empathy, and be a bridge between cultures, specifically those that are in conflict. Today and tomorrow, we have a jam-packed four hours of uh, workshops, scientific talks, and roundtable discussions. We have scientists from neuroscience, researchers from musicology and psychology, and we have influential musicians who are on the ground doing their best to bring together people from across the world, including David Broza, the Jerusalem Youth Course, and more. We hope that you enjoy the symposium, and if it reaches you and you find that you're as passionate about these, this area and this topic as much as we are, please get in touch, and together we'll step into a better future through music. First, before describing and outlining our um, really wonderful program for the next two days, I want to share with you just a glimpse of some of the findings that we've had on the scientific end about how music can bring people together through social neuroscience, big data studies, and studies in the wild. Let's begin with some findings from social neuroscience. In a recently published study with my colleagues Jean Dessetti and Ilanit Gordon, we began to synthesize the literature and map the brain while people make music together, um, namely singing. This is in contrast to a, what a lot of previous work has done before, which has focused on what happens in the brain when people are listening to music or playing music by themselves. And we noted a variety of key areas. For example, when we sing oxytocin, the bonding hormone increases, cortisol, the stress hormone decreases, empathy circuits get activated, and language structures as well as reward areas also become activated. Let's jump now to big data. In a collaboration with Spotify, we built a machine learning algorithm to be able to predict people's personality traits from their Spotify playlist, their musical listening habits, and their preferences. And what we found was that we were able to predict people's preferences with up to 80% accuracy. For example, we could predict trait extroversion with up to 80% accuracy, and other traits in a similar manner. And the patterns of correlations were rather intuitive. For example, extroverts tended to prefer more energetic and rhythmic music, whereas conscientious people who prefer order tended not to like more intense, out-of-the-box um, music. And what's most interesting is that in a recent study in press at JPSP, we found that in a study of more than 300,000 people that these patterns of correlations between music and personality have many universals. For example, the link between extroversion and preferences for contemporary music was present in more than 50 countries. And that link between conscientiousness and intense preferences, the negative correlation was found also in more than 50 countries and was significant. As you can see on this map here, there's not a single country that we observed where the correlation was positive. Now let's jump to a study in the wild. In 2020, I flew from Jerusalem to New York to study a unique group of musicians and non-musicians who were singing Jewish Nagunim. Jewish Nagunim is a form of music that includes spontaneity, repetition, and importantly, wordless melodies. I observed the group for four days and they completed psychometric tests and I also took saliva samples. 
This is an example of what it sounded like. And what we found was that over these four days, group bonding, which includes a sense of togetherness and cohesiveness, increased by 37%. And any depressive symptoms that participants began with, after the four days, it had decreased on average by 33%. These are very high numbers for just four days of a natural, non-pharmacological, non-clinical study or activity. Now, that particular group was of individuals who are typically part of the same in-group. They share a similar religion, a similar culture, and similar beliefs. But what about groups that come from different cultures? Well, I've been working recently with the Jerusalem Youth Chorus. It's a unique ensemble that brings together Palestinian teenagers and Israeli teenagers from East and West Jerusalem. Each and every week, they come together through musical dialogue, they rehearse, they engage in dialogue themselves, and then they also perform their music throughout the year. And this, here's a link of um, what this chorus sounds like. Now, in just a few minutes after my presentation, you'll be able to hear from members of the Jerusalem Youth Chorus themselves, along with their director, director Micah Handler, and in an interview series um, that they have put together for our symposium. So, as for the symposium, coming up next is a special virtual workshop with the Jerusalem Youth Chorus, where you will hear from the members of the chorus themselves. That's going to be followed by a scientific talk by Professor Ilinitz Gordon from Bar Ilan University. We'll be talking about joint drum drumming and its impact on uh, synchronization and physiology. And then um, after that will be a very special roundtable discussion uh, headed by Professor Edwin Sorosi, who will be the master of ceremonies. Um, and on the panel we have David Broza, Micah Handler, and Professor Ruth Hakohen, and they will be discussing how to bring music to life for social change. Now, tomorrow we kick things off with Dr. Tal Chen Rabinowicz, uh, who will be talking about interpersonal synchrony in children and adults, followed by Elena Baruch and Professor Avi Gabor, who will be doing an interactive live workshop on how music is a bridge between conflict. That will be followed by Rebecca Ward, who's the director of Young Musicians for Social Justice, about how um, the next generation of musicians can become change agents.
And then finally, we'll end our symposium with another roundtable discussion, again, with Professor Edwin Sorosi as the Master of Ceremonies and with a really wonderful and diverse panel. We are at a critical point in human history. The World Economic Forum continually states that social division, including intolerance, us and them thinking, and violence is the greatest threat to our society in the near future. And music can be that key to addressing these social issues. And in order to make music that key, it's gonna take an effort from scientists, researchers, musicians, and leaders across different fields to come together and to use music in a way that's not just for entertainment, but that's for building bonds, building empathy, and building mutual understanding. And if we can do that, we can step into and build a better future. Thank you. מה קורה? אני ממש מתגעגעת לכולכם, אז בואו נתחיל. Let's sing, shall we? Here we go. Shall we? Yeah. This is Maria from my house in the old city. This is home from Beit Halina, Jerusalem. How about from Akhadu? This is Akhina, Nini. This is Mira Awad. I love you all. Marhaba, I'm Muhammad Al-Awad from Jawqa. And this is my name. This is Joanna Jones from my home in Hollywood. It's Rami coming to you live from the French show. I'm excited to be connected with everyone across the globe. This is Craig Jessup from my home in Providence, Utah. I'm trying to use my voice to weapon a mass connection. This is Kira Butcher, thinking about him in love. Hi, I'm Sarah Shuri. I'm Casey Ravis, and I'm so happy that this song, Home, that I got to record in JYC, is bringing so many people together at this time. Hi, it's Alice. Hello from my home in Wahhabia. Hold on to me as we go As we roll down some familiar road And all through this world
Today, we have the amazing opportunity to hear from six of our amazing Chorus alumni, Palestinian and Israeli alike, who really grew up in the Jerusalem Youth Chorus. Um, and they have some amazing passion and insight to share about how we could actually get to that better future. Um, and they'll be in conversation today with Dan Shapiro, former US ambassador to Israel, whom we have the great privilege to have gotten to get to know and sing for um, over the years of doing this work. Um, and I just wanted to start by thanking Dan um, so much for being with us today, for taking his time to amplify the voices of these amazing singers. Um, and so Dan, do you want to kick us off today, maybe with a little framing around why, from your perspective as like a diplomat, maybe the work that we're doing is important? Sure. Thank you, Micah. Thank you uh, for the opportunity and the honor uh, to spend uh, an hour together with uh, your amazing singers from the Jerusalem Youth Chorus and so many uh, of the chorus's supporters and fans uh, around uh, Israel, around Palestine, around the globe. Uh, and um, you're right, I, as the years I served as U.S. Ambassador, uh, we had the opportunity to uh, be partners, uh, to enjoy uh, the incredible music uh, that the chorus uh, 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 brings to life, uh, to partner on various other programs, not just me and my embassy staff, but uh, my wife, Julie Fisher, and the diplomatic spouses uh, of Israel that she chaired. Um, uh, all of us who were involved in and had the privilege to take part in uh, the, the uh, Jerusalem Youth Chorus's activities uh, really came to view uh, what the chorus does as, as transformational, uh, not just for the participants. You talked about uh, the meaning of building those connections across 
lines of conflict, helping see uh, the humanity and neighbors who one otherwise doesn't have the opportunity to get to know. And uh, and 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 we live with all live with the tension that uh, that surrounds us. Um, and so, using music, using art, using uh, a shared love uh, for those uh, talents and 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 that beauty uh, is uh, incredibly transformational. But it's more than that. Uh, it is also fundamental uh, to the work of peacemaking. Uh, we diplomats, uh, government officials, work with leaders, work with negotiators, uh, try to help them uh, to learn how and, 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 and have the courage to make hard decisions and, and take risks. Uh, and uh, sometimes that's successful, sometimes it's less successful. When it's successful, though, uh, one thing is clear. Nothing is possible. Nothing can succeed without uh, passionate, motivated, supportive citizens uh, who are leading the way, really more than supporting their leaders, doing what members of the Jerusalem Youth Chorus are doing, which is actually leading the way and the leaders learn to follow them. Um, and that uh, building of the human connection is so fundamental, so absolutely necessary to the work of peacemaking. Uh, whatever the sequence is, it will never work unless uh, more people are uh, brought to uh, these kinds of uh, these kinds of endeavors. So I, 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 I we're just so moved and, and inspired by by what the Jerusalem uh, Youth Chorus does. It, it it does it with beauty, as we just heard a moment ago. Extraordinarily uh, moving and and, and beautiful uh, singing. Uh, it's life changing for the participants, uh, but not just in a personal way. It also has geopolitical. A significance and importance. And I say that as a former uh, American uh, official, uh, thinking about this not only through the lens of what's good for Palestinians and what's good for Israelis and what's good for our friends in this part of the world, but what's good for the United States too. It's, it's, it has that much geopolitical importance that, uh, uh, that, that, that major, major countries uh, should and do, and I hope will continue uh, to, uh, to invest in, uh, in these programs. In fact, I think uh, that's going to be happening more, uh, for at least from the United States, uh, in, in the months ahead. So it is such an honor, such a pleasure uh, to be able to uh, spend this uh, hour together. And uh, Michael, if you're ready, we can uh, turn to the all I might introduce, but I don't know if you have another word before we start that. Yeah, thank you okay. so much, Dan, for your really for your kind words and for all the support that that you and the various colleagues and members of your community have given us over the years. It's truly been so important. Um, and I'll just urge everyone who is here, though you are on mute, we encourage you to resonate wildly in the chat. Um, so please feel free if something that somebody says or sings um, resonates with you. Feel free to share that. We want to hear. Uh, we want to hear what is really touching your heart. Um, so, um, please, uh, please, please feel free to participate um, in that way. Um, yeah, let's do it. Okay. Well, uh, we have six extraordinary alumni who we're going to be privileged to hear from. Uh, and uh, rather than introduce each of them in turn, they know the order in which they'll introduce themselves a little about. Where they're from and their role in the in the in the chorus. Uh, so, uh, Evyatar, we're going to turn to you, and I'll let you pass it down the line. Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Evyatar. I've been to the chorus since. I'm proud to say that I'm a founding member. It's been nine years now. I live in Efrat, which is uh, south of Jerusalem, a settlement south of Jerusalem. Um, a memory from that I really, really remember. One of the first memories that I had from the choir is uh, our first Christmas concert that was uh, that was in the YMCA. I really remember we were so young, you know, teenagers. We came after school and uh, got ready, got dressed up. Everyone helped each other in the backstage, and I really felt like. You know, it, it was our first big concert. We were all so excited to get on stage and it was amazing. It was such a great night. And um, yeah, I sing bass and yeah, that's, that's me. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Amir and I live in East Jerusalem. I'm a Palestinian. I've been in the chorus since 2014 and I used to sing bass, I rap and I beatbox. 
uh, favorite chorus memory of mine is uh, actually the first tour that we've been uh, when we when we've been in in the United States in 2015 when we, when we had this big concert in New York with the other two big famous choirs and we had the sound check and on the sound check we did like really really bad and like we we were like young and we have like the different uh, choruses and like we were like really sad so we went outside and we had like our unstaff meeting together as friends away from all the different identities and people there and just we had the moment that each of us said something about the other and about us as a one group that made us a uh, do a great in the concert and in the end of our meeting we did like this thing and like joic and raised hands and like i'm a big fan of american movies so i was like oh my god i feel like i'm in a movie so yeah um yeah and then we did really great in the concert and after micah bought us uh, ice cream so this is my favorite story nice to meet you all Hi, uh, my name is Orit. I am, um, I've also been in the choir since, since right the beginning. I'm an alto. I, I'm originally from a moshav in the south of Israel, but I went to a boarding school in Jerusalem, so I got, so that's how I um, got to the choir. And one of my favorite memories of being in the choir was our tour to Japan, because who else gets to go to Japan when they're 16? <laughs> One of the things I think our, our next uh, participant uh, on this panel is Alea, and Alea um, will get to speak for himself. But one of the things that I wanted to just emphasize is also that the chorus operates in three languages, and everything that we do um, is important that it be accessible to folks who speak whatever their mother tongue may be, and that people can come as themselves also linguistically. And so for Alea, um, even though over the years uh, he has gained incredible English and Hebrew abilities, um, still is most comfortable speaking in Arabic. So I'll be translating uh, for Alaa. Tafadal Habib. I'm Alaa. And I've been here for nine years. I've been playing bass and some of the songs. And the best memory I have for the song is that we were in Sweden once. And it was at the end of the performance. So it was a lot of fun for me. فالعالم انبسطوا منها وحكوا لي انها تطبل بعد ما خلصنا الاغنيه فطبلت يعني بعد الحفله كان وبعدين كلنا طلعنا برا وصرنا نرقص في الساحه قدام الكنيسه صرنا كلنا نرقص مع بعض مع كل الناس اللي كانت بالشارع واللي جاي واللي رايح فهي كانت احلى ذكرى لي شكرا علاء um, so Alea is saying hi my name is Alea um, I've been in the chorus for nine years I'm also a founding member um, I uh, sing bass and I also play percussion. And my favorite memory is when we were in Switzerland, uh, we were doing our last concert of the tour and we played this great song and everyone was so excited and people just told me, Alea, keep drumming. And so I kept drumming and it became just like a huge party. And we went out of the church onto the street in this main square and just kept drumming and dancing and the whole street just started dancing with us. Um, and it just became this big block party. Um, and, and that's a memory that's really important to me. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. My name is Renin. Um, I'm part of the choir for seven years now. Uh, I sing the soprano part. And a favorite memory of mine is, so when we travel, I have a tendency to just fall asleep everywhere. And Ala manages to just document every time I fall asleep. So I have a whole album of just me sleeping everywhere. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Sifra. Um, I live in Baca in Jerusalem. And I sing tenor. And I've been in the choir. I'm also a founding member. So I've been in it since 2012. And one of my favorite memories actually involves Renin. Um, over, I think, a year and a half ago, two years ago now, um we had a concert and it was in front of 2000 people and we were singing viva la vida by coldplay and i remember we both had solos and 
Ranine was telling me she was like worried that she'd forget the words and I was like I'm not going to forget the words I think it's going to be fine you're going to be great she like wrote the word we wrote the words on our hands I think just to like you know make sure that we could get it we step onto the stage everything's good as I as I got there though I realized I completely blanked like I just didn't know what the words were I completely forgot them and when it came to my turn I stepped forward and nothing came out I just didn't know I didn't I was completely blank and without even saying anything I barely even looked at Renin she stepped forwards and she just took over like she just knew that it was her time to like come and rescue me and she did it and it was just the best moment um because we didn't even have a chance to like look at each other and she was already there so yeah mm -hmm. Well, thanks uh, to all of our panelists. Uh, I wish we had, uh, we wish we would have time uh, in the discussion we're about to have to hear each of you uh, tell more stories and answer each of the questions that I'll pose. Uh, but we don't have that much time, so I'll direct some of the questions to each of you. And uh, but if anybody has something to jump in with uh, in response, by by all means. So uh, let's start with uh, Orit and Amer, and I'd love for each of you uh, to tell us why you joined the course. Uh, in the first place, uh, and what were some of the challenges uh, that you faced in the in the years you've been involved? Uh, Orit, let's start with you, and then Amr. So I joined the choir um, because of my love for singing, and one of the main challenges that I faced was the disapproval of people around me uh, to me being a part of the choir, and specifically the disapproval the disapproval of my dad. So when we first had our, our first, very first concert, the one that Eveta mentioned earlier, it was the Christmas concert at the YMCA. And we were all very excited for it. And I, I invited both my parents to come and watch us and they were super excited. Up until my dad realized it was a Christmas concert and I'm Jewish. So my dad got super mad. He thought that Micah was trying to convert his uh, little girl to Christianity. And, I remember he called Micah and he like yelled at him and he was furious and it was very upsetting. And my parents, like obviously I explained that that's not the point and Micah also did explain, but my dad didn't really understand the whole, the whole idea of like interfaith music and just living together. But so he never came to that Christmas, to that Christmas concert and he didn't come to any of the other Christmas concerts in the years that it followed. But um, and it was actually a very sore spot for me. You know, it was like a very sore spot in my relationship with my dad. But the thing is that even though my dad didn't like it, I was still in the choir. And it makes me think about all the other kids whose parents didn't approve of it. And they couldn't be in the choir. And I can tell you that each one of these uh, members, like each one of my friends that are here in this panel, can tell you about a family member or a friend or maybe even like a stranger they just told them what they think of the choir and how much they <laughs> disapprove of it. But the thing is that our love for each other and our support for each other in the choir is what makes us have the confidence to still do what we're doing and what makes it, it's what makes it all worth it. So, yeah. Thanks for that story, Ari. Honor? Yeah, thank you, Dan. Again, hello for everyone. Yeah, so people usually uh, join the choir when we go and uh, uh, bring people to the choir from their schools. But uh, for, for my case, I was already in the YMCA since the Jerusalem Youth, youth Course used to meet at the, uh, uh, at the YMCA in Jerusalem. So I used to sit, I, I, I used to go there to have boring video editing course. And I used to sit in, in, in the room with my computer and editing the, the, the videos and hearing the choir inside singing really awesome. And I was like, man, I wish I could sing. So yeah, so I got really interested in the choir. So I, I reached out to Mike and I told him, hey, I would love to make an uh, audition. So the, he said yes. And we, we set up a date and an hour. And the night before my meeting, my, my interview, I watched, uh, 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 in the night, I watched a uh, Captain America movie. It's a Marvel movie, the first movie for who watched it. And there's the, the, the hero, before he becomes hero, is really short, thin, uh, unstrong dude that he wants to be in the army and, and, and be there uh, for, for his country. And he just keep applying for the army and his application just get refused each, every time until 
one commander comes and he said and he accepts him and he tells him why me and he said because you are a good man so i went to the audition the next day and before i opened my mouth and sang because i'm not godly gifted with a great voice i don't sing i don't have a good voice so before i opened my mouth i said micah i know that i'm not a good singer but i am a good man <laughs> so yeah and from there my journey started in 2014 and uh, I had really such a, a great time. And one of the hardest challenges that I, it was really hard for me that to be in this awesome uh, program and not being able to tell my friends about as, as, a, as a youth in the school, I wanted to tell everyone about it, but it was really hard because I go up and perform with Israeli, the other side, the people who occupied my land, but some, so, something that i discovered through the years in the choir that i'm still amr the palestinian that who who believes that for me uh, israel came and occupied my land but in the choir they give me the space to say this to my friend shifra respectfully and she would hear me and respect me and i would hear her opinion and how she looks at it so I, I came up that I, I understood that the choir doesn't change your identity. It, it just opens it up more and more. Thank you. Wow, Thank you, uh, Amr. Just a, a beautiful, beautiful story. Um, we'll turn now to uh, Ranin and then uh, Shifra and then Allah. And uh, we'd love to hear each of you. Uh, we've heard a couple of stories about joining the chorus, but talk, talk to us about uh, what made you continue uh, with the chorus, uh, despite the obstacles that you faced, which it sounds like all of you have faced at one time or another. Uh, so we'll start with you, Ranin. And Ranin, may please uh, start by telling us where uh, you're from. I don't think you you mentioned it in the in the in your first introduction. Where where are you where are you from? Hi, sorry. So I'm from Abu Ghosh. And now to answer your question, um, joining the choir wasn't a big change for me because I was already part of a bilingual school that had both Arabs and Jews study in the same classroom. So I was kind of used to the idea of coexistence. But during one of the dialogue sessions, there was an incident where one of the participants there uh, told me that Arabs shouldn't even be here. And it's a shame that the Iron Dome is even protecting your house and such slurs. So I, I was shocked when I first heard this because I assumed that the people who went to the choir knew what the goal of the choir is. So I just left the room crying and I remember that I just got so upset and I was like, okay, I'm not gonna continue in this choir anymore. I was just so sick of being discriminated against and I felt like I'm so much less just because I'm Palestinian or just because I'm Arab. But after thinking about it, I realized that I should be actually motivated by those kind of incidents because like seeing the discrimination that my people go through and they don't even have the chance to talk about it. But on the other hand, I do have the chance to talk about it. It looks like I have a privilege to talk about the, the, discrim the discrimination and the racism. So I thought that I should appreciate this opportunity, even though it's one of the most basic human rights to be able to express yourself. As some of you may know, as Palestinians, we don't really have a place or an opportunity to talk about discrimination without having backlash because of it. So today, the choir for me is the only safe place that I can express myself in and to talk about my struggle and my people's struggle and just feel safe. And I think we should strive to create more places like this, to let people feel safe to talk about their experiences. And that's the reason I stayed in the choir, to like be the voice of the unheard. That is uh, just incredibly powerful, uh, Rani. Thank you for, for telling us that, uh, that story. Uh, Shifra, how about you? Yeah, I just want to start off by saying that was really beautiful, Rani. Um, yeah, that was amazing. Um, so I think for me as well, uh, a lot of what motivated me to stay, I came to the choir because I love singing and then I sort of learned this whole new world. And what motivated me to stay was, honestly, a lot of the times it was the backlash that I got for being in the chorus. And there were, there were many reasons why I wanted to stay, but that was something that really motivated me. Um, and a story that I have that I think really exemplifies that is um, when I was in high school. So 
Micah used to give us leaflets for recruiting and we used to be able to go to our uh, our classrooms and to tell people, you know, I'm in this choir, it's really cool. So I asked one of the teachers if I could speak at the end of class. And I said, I just have a little announcement to make. I didn't say what the choir was, not on purpose. I just said, I have something small to say. I started reading from the pamphlet at the end of the lesson. And uh, he stopped me. He was like, don't you dare speak about something like this in my class. Like you're like, you're wasting breath, like something like that, very like aggressive. Um, and I was so shocked because it was the first time that I had like a direct sort of like backlash like that. And I was thinking about my friends and I was thinking about how much I love the choir. And I was like quite a shy kid in high school, but I was like, I am going to finish this leaflet. So it ended with like me standing on a chair and like the teacher trying to tell me to stop. And I was like, so if anybody wants to come, like, it was just like a whole thing. Um, and then this sort of continued throughout all the years of high school that happened when I was in ninth grade. So until I was a senior, this same teacher really had a problem with the choir and, um, he was quite high up. So when I was a senior doing my senior project for art, I was in an art class. I did it on people in the choir photography project. And basically I asked everybody what gives you hope and I blew it up on a big canvas I put quotes underneath it and then I made a book of pictures of people in the choir and I took quotes about like how they feel about the choir and um, this teacher didn't allow the Palestinians who were in my project to come into the school to see my project and I was so upset about it and uh, a lot of my friends had actually already come to the choir they met people so it kind of shows like that domino effect of like they also felt like it was really unfair and we kind of rallied together and were like they have to be able to come and eventually it worked and they did come um, and it was amazing and really beautiful and I think just things like that it's it's might sound like something small but it's huge and you get to make changes not only in my own life but in other people's lives as well and they get to see how amazing the choir is. Thank, thank you, Shifra. Uh, Allah, uh, Mike, I don't know if you're gonna try to translate the question, but Allah, we're uh, asking about what made you continue with the course uh, despite obstacles you may have faced. Okay. <laughs> كان يمنعني وكمان بنفس الوقت إنه كنت أقدر أسمع أصتي أكثر لأنه لو كنت أحكي عن أصتي مع فلسطينيين ما كان عندهم إمكانيات إنه مسمعوها لأكثر ناس فكثير كثير إنه ساعدني إنه العالم يسمع أصتي مثلا زي الوركشوب تبعتنا هلأ فكثير ليش بساعد وفي مرة من المرات في 2015 كنا While we're waiting for Allah's internet to come back, I'll translate the beginning of his story. Um, what Allah was saying is that the reason that the that he wanted to continue in the chorus is similar actually to what Ranin said about having a space to actually be heard and a space to really tell his story um, in a way that can actually make a difference um, to, to others who may not know about such stories. Um, and so he, uh, also, like, for example, if he were in a group just of Palestinians, you know, his story would not be heard in the same way um, as it is coming from a group of Palestinians and Israelis. Um, and so the story that that he's going to tell, I think we just lost Ale, um, but hopefully he'll be back by the time I set up the beginning of the story, um, which is um, a story of actually a time when we were on tour in uh, in the United States around the same tour that Amer was talking about. Um, and we had the opportunity to go to the State Department in Washington, D.C. Um, and actually meet uh, some diplomats at the State Department and uh, talk to them um, and share some of our experiences uh, with them. And I'm hoping that Allah will uh, regain internet. Um, okay, here he is. Move on to others, and then it, when Allah joins, we'll come back. Allah, and I just let him back in. Hopefully, this will uh, work. Allah and Tamana. Oh, Asif, راحت الكهرباء ورجعت بسرعة. مش مشكلة. So Allah, Allah lost electricity for a moment, but it came back on. 
ام سو على انا انا حكيت عن كل القصة حتى انه نحن بالوزاره الخارجيه بواشنطن دي سي بس ما حكيت شو صار اوكي ايه فجابوا لنا شخص انه نقعد نساله اشياء عشان يساعدنا نحكي بمواضيع الحوار اللي كانت تصير بيننا في الجوقه ففي في بنت كان عمرها 15 او 16 سنه سالته انه كيف بدنا كيف بتقدروا تساعدوا انه نحمي حالنا من من الارهابيين والناس الموجودين بغزه وبالضفه فعادي يعني سؤال عادي هو جاوبها على انه انه ما يعني ما صلحش تفكيرها انه جاوبها انه احنا بنحاول نساعدكم تحموا حالكم من هدول الناس اللي بتحكي عنهم انت ارهابيين يعني يعني ما حكى لانه هم مش ارهابيين فاكد لها انهم ارهابيين هو بده يساعدها انها تحمي حالها منهم فكان لي كثير مثير للاهتمام هذا الجواب والسؤال كمان بس هو بني ادم كثير واعي يعني ومسؤول يعني بفكر والبنت كانت عمرها 15 سنه فسالته انا سؤال كان السؤال انه طلبت منه يحكي لي فرد عن الجيش الاسرائيلي وعن الحمولات اللي في غزه والجيوش اللي كانت في غزه او بالضفه ف ما 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 اعطاني جواب واضح وقعد يبرر لي في اشياء ثانيه يعني بالمره ما كان في جواب ف يعني انا بشوف يعني كثير كان مش مؤزل اني اشوف بني ادم بدل ما يصلح تفكير حدا بيساعدها على التطرف شكرا حبيبي Um, so Allah, we're picking up uh, where we're at the State Department in Washington, D.C., and um, we were in a meeting with uh, one of the diplomats who was working on the, uh, the desk related to Israeli-Palestinian relations, and uh, we had opportunities to ask questions uh, of that person about, you know, whatever we felt was important. And one of the girls uh, in the choir asked a question about Um, what the U.S. was going to do to protect uh, Israel from various uh, terrorist threats coming from Gaza and the West Bank, um, specifically about, I, I, I recall, um, specifically about uh, tunnels that were being dug at that time. And, and the State Department official was answering, the, like, of course, like, we're doing our best to, to protect you in the following ways. Um, and, of course, the fundamental assumption there was, you know, that Uh, sort of, you know, that the characterization um, of, of terrorism, of course, was like completely accepted there um, in terms of the way the question had been asked. Um, and so then Allah um, uh, had an opportunity to ask a question um, and said, okay, so I totally understand, you know, the, you know, the previous question and, and you know, that people should be safe. Um, and can you explain to me the, the difference between sort of the different uh, groups that you characterized as terrorists coming from Gaza and the West Bank um, and, the, and some of the actions of the Israeli army, aside from the fact that one has a state and is official um, and the other is not? Um, and that official didn't have an answer. Um, and for Allah, um, as someone at that time, I think, uh, Allah, you were like 15, so, so like the idea that, uh, for, for someone who's 15 to be able to actually ask a question like that to a senior diplomat and, and actually have their voice be heard in that kind of a forum, uh, was incredibly important. Shukran, Habib. Um, all right, let's turn to the, the last portion of the panel. Um, and I'm going to ask Evyatar uh, and Orit and then uh, Amr and Shifra to tell us about how you actually carry the values and experiences uh, that you've had in, in the course uh, into your life today. Each of you uh, has some uh, element that that's uh, going on to your life beyond uh, your, the, 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 the singing in the chorus. So, Evyatar, let's start with you. Um, well, I think that most of all, the choir gave me knowledge and tools to raise a voice that isn't that is really not heard within my social circles. 
uh, I saw it a lot in my military service. I saw, I'm, I'm seeing it now at my university when I'm studying law and psychology at IDC. And they always feel like I have that important input to discussions. And that's something that it is really not heard at all. Uh, where like around my friends, within my friends. Also in the army, I've been a combat commander in the Air Force. And as a commander, you have the opportunity to give moral lectures to your soldiers, to give them something from you uh, that you want them to know or to um, care with them during their service. And I really remember there was one time that I made a lecture about um, those stereotypes about the situations, bringing another, maybe, it was not political at all. It was just a session about, um, you know, knowledge, things that I really felt my soldiers were, I mean, they got to see another point of view and to not use certain words they used during their, in, during their service. And I really feel that without choir, I wouldn't be able to do that at all. And yeah. Well, guys, you should have seen Evitar the first years in the choir. He's like the coolest kid was in the in the choir. And like even when he left, we made the he was like the only one that we made a goodbye party for him. He was like the coolest kid in the choir. So thank you, Evitar. Incredible. Or read. So I think that one of the most uh, important and essential things that the choir has given me was a chance to interact and to get to speak and to be friends with Palestinians, which would probably wouldn't have happened otherwise. So I'm a student at the Hebrew University, and we have a lot of Arab students as well as Jews, but there is a lot of uh, separation and distance and alienation between us. And my best friend from university, his name is Ghaleb, and he's a Palestinian. And for us, it's the most natural things. Like, we're just best friends, and we have a great time together. But I know that for, for others, it's not very natural. Uh, they usually don't even know how to make that first step. And when they do, it's often very uh, weird and awkward. Like, I can give you an example of a time when the both of us were sitting in the library with another friend. And she, she's she's Jewish, and we were just sitting in the library doing our homework. And suddenly, she looks at him and she asks him, "Well, if there's going to be a Palestinian state, will you move there?" And I remember he was like shocked, and he didn't really know what to say. And as for me, I have had the experience, and I know that there's a place. And there's a way to talk about these things. And I even had a great experience in asking the hard questions. And like, we do talk about these things, but we talk about our own experiences I and mean, about our personal views. But sometimes people just treat him like he's some kind of representative for the, for the Palestinian nation when he's, you know, he's just a guy. And I think it's like, this thing is gonna stay with me forever. And I think it's a great privilege to have had that and to keep having this in my life. Thank you. Thank you, Ori. Uh, Amer and Shifra, would you like to uh, talk about uh, the values and experience you had in the course, how they're, how they're impacting your life today? Um, sure. Is, is Amer here? Oh, yeah, he is here. Amer, yeah. you want to go first? Um, I don't mind. You go. Uh, yeah, so... I, I actually couldn't just talk on, on one value. Uh, I think the choir was a whole big process for me. It just like shaped who I am, shaped the way I think. And I actually today when I'm grown up and like uh, see see around, I could see the difference and I could see how, how, how open I would be and like how the choir changed me, especially uh, that today I'm working, uh, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer that works in a, in a law office in, in the city center here. And just like the way being there just helped me 
through so many problems that I would have been going through if I couldn't go uh, this uh, uh, experience. Also, one month ago, I had a, we, we, me and my friend that he used to be in the choir in 2014, and he stayed with us. Uh, we sat like uh, 30 days ago, a month ago, and I couldn't believe what he told me because in, during the choir years, he was the unpaying attention dude that he just like always runs and, you know, the kid in the school that he never paying attention. This was him. So a month ago, he told me, Amir, I thought the things that we've been taught in the choir, it's just like uh, empty stuff. We will never get something from. And then he told me, I see the difference between me and my brother. I, I, I could see how open I am and how I, he's a mechanic also. And he told me even the choir helped him to talk and see different people in his work. And just for me hearing that coming from, from the dude that he never paid attention, just like really touched me. And that's why I believe that this work should continue. And that's why the six of us are here today after nine years and we're still here because we made a really great friendships. We love each other and we love the choir and we want this work to continue uh, for, for whatever it takes. And today I work in the choir as a, uh, I used to be a translator. I'm today also the alumni coordinator. And uh, this year I had the pleasure to work as a songwriting uh, workshop, to give songwriting workshops for, for, uh, for the younger uh, new members of the choir. And we had this program of, like recording for them and me and Shifra actually working on that. And that came uh, from after me and Shifra together outside of the choir program together, we met, we wrote a song, we filmed the video clip, and we enjoyed it. And with Micah's help, for sure, because he's like the music genius. But uh, after this experience, I believe that everything is possible and accepting the others is something is possible, but something that we need to work on. And this is why this work should continue. And I'll just hop onto that as well. Um, for me, I think that, you know, the choir has really changed everything in my life. Like I would be a different person a hundred percent. If I hadn't have gone to the choir, I wouldn't think the same way I do now. Uh, my experiences would just be completely different. And um, I saw someone in the chat, I think Bruno asked how we had the opportunity to uh, sort of talk about the choir or our experiences while we were in the army. So I'll tie that into my answer as well, because I think that like you just take it with you wherever you go. And when I was in the army, I didn't really know how to broach it. And then I just decided to tell everyone I knew about the choir. And I was like, people are going to either say that they like it or they don't, but this is, it, it's here, it's there. And, you know, people, I mean, I got all different kinds of reactions, but I was already used to that from high school and from all of the years before. And I just decided, and I do this, you know, now as well, I tell everybody who I can and I try and just, let people know that it's there. I don't think everybody is going to always show love, but um, I think it's important to just not, not hide it. And also I was never shut down, which was good. I was never talking about it, you know, like with my unit or something like that. I was very lucky that, you know, they were open to hearing about it. But um, as Amar said as well, like I'm a, I'm a singer songwriter and I produce music and to be able to take that and bring it to the next generation of kids in the chorus is just so incredible because not only do we have that experience of like being, we were in the choir and now we get to sort of see that experience happen with like the younger kids, but also we get to do what we love and bring that in with them as well. And I just think that it's, it's one of the most incredible things. And I've learned so much just from this year being sort of on the outside as a staff member about the kids and what this kind of thing does, even though we've been doing it on Zoom, like you can just see the barriers break down and like how incredible these kids are. So, yeah. I wanted to take a moment just to talk about songwriting for a moment because it's actually been very important to us this year. As, as many of you, particularly who are singers may know, choruses don't work so well uh, in a coronavirus pandemic. Um, and so we've actually just gotten more creative and pivoted our entire program this year to a virtual dialogue and collaborative songwriting program. 
which is actually being led by two of our alumni who are on this call, Amer and Shifra. Um, and so they'll be able to tell you more about that later. Um, throughout this year, our high schoolers have been learning songwriting skills and building trust and communication with one another um, in the dialogue process as they tackle difficult issues with courage and respect. And I just wanted to share a moment with all of you from our last session just on Monday, where we started the collaborative songwriting process with our younger dialogue group. And so as we started, I asked them what they wanted to sing about, right? Like what did they feel was an important way they wanted their voices to be heard? What is something that they care about where they feel that their voices can uniquely make a difference? And what emerged on a number of themes really revolved around our interdependence. And one of the singers talked about the importance of actually caring about what happens to one another and the barriers that get in the way of our actually caring about one another. Um, and one Palestinian girl actually shared that earlier this year, she had actually gotten COVID and was lamenting how so many people in her community didn't actually think that COVID was real. And so they didn't take precautions to keep one another safe. Um, and this year, I think COVID in a way that's been more like in your face than perhaps anything that I can really remember um, has shown us how really interdependent we all are. Um, but also that without bonds of trust and concern between us, even across lines of conflict and division, we can't actually tackle the complex challenges that, that face all of us and affect all of us. Um, and so what we do in the Jerusalem Youth Chorus every day is to sustain those spaces for open communication and to build those bonds of trust and to amplify the voices of those who can lead us to a better future. Hello. I think this is where I'm supposed to be at this point. Hi, can you hear me? Thumbs up, excellent. Oh, all the thumbs up, <laughs> so many thumbs. Um, more thumbs. I've never seen so many thumbs in my life. Um, are you Professor Hakoyan? Uh, I think we have to start at some point. Is Edwin there? I think we, I, I, uh, I know Edwin uh, was, and then there was sort of a confusion about the timing, and hopefully he will join us on stage shortly. Um, I think that uh, due to the confusion and timing, unfortunately, David Broza can't be on the panel. He, he wrote me that uh, the ah, new time didn't okay. work for him, sadly. Um, so it's, uh, mm. as my mother would say, just as chickens. Hopefully Edwin <laughs> will be here soon, our fearless leader. Yeah, okay, let's try to do our best anyway. Uh, yes, here we have I another four minutes. Hi, Edwin. My... Oh, here I am. Here is Edwin. How are you? Yeah, I'm very here sorry I for, yet. for, for uh, all the confusion. So we will start right now. We were supposed to start in four minutes from now according to what uh, David uh, told me, but uh, since we are on stage, I will just uh, uh, read the short introduction that uh, I prepared. And thank you, Mika, and thank you, Ruth. Uh, it's a pity that uh, David cannot be here, but uh, I'm glad, Mika, that you know, because I, I didn't know. Yeah, um, no, he just wrote me, just, it was all very confusing with the timing. Yeah, yeah, okay. But uh, never mind. Uh, this is, uh, uh, we will have uh, enough to say anyway, uh, all of us, and certainly we will allow uh, more time to, uh, to the participants in the symposium. So uh, colleagues and friends, uh, so welcome to this uh, symposium uh, dedicated to the power of music to transform society. And as David uh, Greenberg already introduced us as an initiative of uh, One World in Song, 
an enterprise uh, initiated by Chaim Roth, a visionary industrialist engaged in bettering human life globally. And One World in Song combines the scholarly efforts of scientists in the field of music cognition and musicology with the social activism. And Dr. David Greenberg, a neuroscientist specializing in music, is the director of or coordinator of One World in Song. And he initiated and coordinated these uh, two panels today and tomorrow. So we are thankful to David for his uh, efforts. Uh, I am Edwin Sarusi, professor of musicology at the Hebrew University and a member of One World in Song. And I will be uh, honored to serve as a chairperson of uh, this uh, symposium. We have uh, six very distinguished participants, actually five. Uh, in two panels today and tomorrow, and I will be introducing them uh, shortly. Uh, before that, just a word about the protocol of these uh, two uh, sessions of the symposium. Uh, I will make a very, very short opening remarks that will be followed by an expo short expositions from our panelists. And uh, then uh, from there, we will continue into a more or less uh, open conversation in which uh, the public is uh, invited to participate uh, via the chat. And I think we will be able also to see you and to allow you to come into the stage and uh, you can present uh, your questions or your interventions uh, live. Let me start by, start by uh, stating that the One World in Song we aim to bring together expert voices from different perspectives, including science, religion, and industry, to discuss the social power of music and how it can be used in action to facilitate uh, social change and improvement. And we will ask our panelists uh, today and the public participating in this event uh, three short questions. Number one, how music can facilitate empathy and social change on a global scale? Two, how music can be used in educational settings in order to encourage a new generation of human beings committed to empathy and tolerance towards others with differing perceptions of the world. And three, how can music making be used to build communities based on tolerance and empathy in the face of seemingly intractable internal divisions of different kinds affecting most societies today? In short, we are here to identify practical ideas for how music can be used in actual communities, as we just saw beautifully with the YMCA choir around the world, to improve lives coming together side by side through music and song. Uh, consequently, uh, my first uh, question uh, to the panelists will be, do we have any tangible proof that music works in the directions we envision? namely fostering tolerance and empathy, or not? Or are we just fantasizing? Is music the ultimate dialogical bridge, or is this a myth or fact based on evidence on the ground? Can music also separate between human beings? I will just leave it there, and it will be my pleasure to introduce the panelists uh, of today. We regretfully uh, and we apologize that uh, because of time confusion, we cannot have David Groza, uh, Groza an Israeli singer songwriting that has uh, fused many musical styles. Uh, David, uh, in 1913, uh, began a project bringing together Israeli and Palestinian musicians for eight days and nights of working side by side in East Jerusalem. And the result of that is the album East Jerusalem, West Jerusalem, that is quite well known. Uh, David was appointed a goodwill ambassador for UNICEF, and his song together became the theme of UNICEF's 50th anniversary. Regretfully, David is not here, uh, but I hope that we will hear his voice in the future. Our second uh, panelist uh, is uh, my colleague, Professor Ruta Cohen of the Department of Musicology, Professor of Musicology at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Professor Cohen investigates the modes in which music participates in shaping the emotional, religious, and political worlds as a source for conflict and a medium for reconciliation and compassion. 
Her publications include the musical label Against Jews, published in 2011, Composing Power, Singing Freedom, The Interplay of Music and Politics in the West, published 2017 with Yaron Ezrahi. She has contributed to various public uh, institutions such as the seminars on the Polyphony Foundation in Nazareth for creating a common ground for Israeli and Palestinian musicians. And our third and final panelist, uh, which we saw in the beautiful previous video, Mika Handler, is a singer-songwriter and uh, self-defined, uh, certainly we can assert that, a musical change maker. He created, as you saw, the Jerusalem Youth Chorus at the YMCA, uh, which uh, brings together Palestinian and Israeli high school students from East and West Jerusalem and from other parts of the country, as we saw. Each and every week, the, choir, the chorus learns uh, music uh, from each other's cultures and engage in dialogue sessions. Uh, and Mikas and the choirs had toured uh, since 2012 in the United States and Japan. Uh, in 2017, uh, Mika was named uh, to the Forbes 30 under 30 list. So he's uh, a very uh, famous uh, uh, um, colleague and individual, and we really admire Mika, your, your words. So having said all that, uh, I pass. Uh, the stage uh, into Ruth. Uh, Ruth, uh, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Edwin, my colleague, my dear colleague, and uh, it's, it's, I'm glad to also to be introduced to you, my, my Micha, Micah. Uh, it was really wonderful to watch you working with the choir, with the YMCA choir, and learned a lot about your activities, and it will somehow be uh, part of our discussion uh, this afternoon. Uh, so, as Edwin says, we all believe that music plays a role in bridging cultures and overcoming social conflicts, but some of us have had to admit in the past already that it's, it's limitations in this regard. It's very important before we are celebrating musical powers to think about it, because we, if we are not thinking about these negative elements, we can fall into this sort of sentimentality that is not really helpful in trying to think what work, what works, and how it should work. So that's my the, the, the way that I would like to, to open our discussion, it's the sort of disclaimer, if you want. So my first point is that communities are recognized, among other things, through their sonic lore. Everybody knows that. What sounds they identify themselves with or create in order to identify themselves with could be noise to adversarial communities. I devoted a lot of time in order to understand this about Jews and Christians. Uh, indeed, music of the other may sound senseless, pagan, too exotic, and as I said, noisy. This may lead even to conflicts over the harmonious virtues, sounds uh, that you think that uh, you are making, and so on. So this is. I think it's a very, very important thing to take into consideration wherever we are thinking, whenever we are thinking about the universality of music. The second point is that music may act, and we know that it has been acting in this way in the last decades, unfortunately, as a punitive tool, even as a torturing vehicle for criminals or so, so a considered criminals or the other detainees and, and there are all kinds of uh, uh, evidence about that, and I will not take, uh, uh, some, some of you know about it. The third point is that certain musics and in certain doses may badly affect the minds of those using it. Which music and whence? It is a question that bothered educators and philosophers for millennia, at least since Plato, but even beforehand. Sometimes they categorize the music of the other as such, so, it, so to determine whether indeed music can be damaging is not an easy case. We, know, we all know about uh, the uh, Beatles that were not uh, allowed to enter Israel uh, more than 50 years ago, and prejudices uh, often play the part, but sometimes there is a real damage, so how to distinguish between these cases is, a, is, a, is, is an 
important. Now, any account of the ameliorating powers of music must take at least these three reservations into account and then proceed to see what is still valid among those mythical powers we are used to hang on music. That's what I would like to do uh, later on, but th that's for the, my opening remarks. Thank you. I cannot hear you. Edwin, we cannot hear you. Yeah, yeah, you can hear me. Now we can. Yes, I'm trying to turn yeah. off the mic uh, while you are speaking, just for your sake. I'm sorry about that. So, yeah, I, uh, you actually uh, brought the, the points that I, I was going to uh, bring a little bit later on. Uh, the uh, fa very famous musicologist uh, wrote an article called The Dangers of Music. So music can be uh, dangerous uh, too. Uh, it has to be administered. Uh, I would say in uh, in in a very uh, uh, careful and, and thoughtful uh, uh, way. So uh, I would uh, pass into you, Mika or Micha, uh, um, uh, the the right to present your position, and then we will uh, continue by returning perhaps to this uh, uh, tricky issue of music as danger. Perfect. Well, thank you, Edwin. Thank you, Ruth. Um, I can say as uh, as as a student um, uh, studying ethnomusicology and trying to learn about music and conflict and how they could work together, um, I remember reading uh, both of your work extensively when I was in uh, college. So it's exciting to be on this panel. Um, yeah, I agree, Ruth, a thousand percent with everything that you said. So if you were hoping that this was going to be, you know, like, a, you know, debate to the death over like the virtues of music or not, I'm going to be very boring here. Um, it's something that I uh, also go to a lot is this idea that, you know, everyone, as you were saying, Ruth, people like to say, oh, music is this universal language or like music can like bring peace or like all the, you know, sort of these like slogans that have a grain of truth sometimes, but vastly oversimplify and overstate um, what is actually going on um, in what I can say is with the Jerusalem Youth Chorus, it has been extremely complex and extremely nuanced and extremely um, challenging to find the right formula and the right set of parameters um, so that we can actually do something good um, and helpful rather than something harmful um, in a context where generally speaking, parameters are designed to harm. Um, you know, not necessarily sort of musically, but, you know, in the relationship between Israelis and Palestinians, there isn't a lot of setup for people to, you know, have equitable and, you know, mutually respectful relationships. It's just not the way that either society is designed or, you know, that all the incentives are in the opposite direction and people's uh, people are taught to be sensitive to things that will trigger them from normal things, as you were saying, Ruth, like that somebody else is just normal expression is often inherently triggering uh, to somebody from the other group. And so the question of how you create musical shared space is something that um, we've given a great deal of thought to and have experimented with also over the years and have made mistakes and have sort of retooled and grown in different ways as we try to create an equalizing musical space uh, where everybody in the group, no matter what musical culture they come from, can feel celebrated, um, not just as a person, but as a musician in our group. Um, and so it's extremely important to say that we are not a standard choir in any way. Um, and um, specifically, um, as regards sort of the types of music that we sing and even the way that we approach singing um, is fundamentally from a perspective of questioning all the rules and trying to see and like the rules, right, quote unquote, of like what a choir is, um, which are generally Western uh, European classical in uh, origin um, and trying to instead use 
what I would agree with is an extraordinary power of singing, specifically communal singing, to create a sense of shared identity and community um, when used right. Um, to wield that power um, consciously uh, to create a space that is actually inclusive and equitable and then can serve as a platform to actually use music to call for and set an example for a kind of societal change that we want to see. Thank you very much, Mika, uh, for these uh, illuminating ideas. Uh, let me now uh, continue the conversation by uh, refocusing on, on uh, two uh, issues. First of all, we are in a conference of music cognition, so we have the issue of uh, our idea of music influence on on individuals uh, on on, as, on a biological basis, if I may say, on a physical basis and on a philosophical basis. That, that is to say, uh, going through the body or going through the ideas. Uh, so, in what ex to what extent uh, do you think that this uh, uh, two elements uh, can be uh, deployed in order to uh, foster and reach the, the goals, uh, the noble goals that, uh, that uh, we have. And focusing more, and, and Micha, you already hinted a little bit on what type of uh, musical communities, I'm using uh, one of Ruth's uh, uh, concepts, what, what, to what level of musical communities and methodologies, I would really like to move into methodologies on how to really do this uh, in real life. What works, what cannot work. Uh, I can tell a little bit about my own experience, but I will keep it for, for later on. Uh, but I would just say uh, you know, from my own experience that sometimes changing political extra musical um, uh, events can affect uh, your project. Your project may be uh, going well to a certain point, political circumstances change and you go back and actually your project becomes more harmful than useful. So uh, any uh, ideas that you can um, develop uh, over these two axes of uh, uh, the cognitive versus the cultural, if I may say, and also the practical issue of creating musical communities that can uh, promote uh, the ideals that we have in mind. Ruth, please. Ruth, now you're on mute. Yeah, you. I'm sure it'll happen to me later on. It's just a matter of time. <laughs> yes. Lots of things that you mentioned, uh, Edwin, and I would like to, uh, to st start saying several things. And if I'm st talking too much, just uh, stop me. Uh, so first of all, about uh, the cognitive element, I would like to, to uh, address this in relation to uh, how uh, do those good effects that, as you so beautifully shown uh, to your choir, uh, Niger, and the good effects of music will be more deeply uh, rooted in those who are part of such a choir or such a community. And there is a difference indeed between choir and community. Maybe later on I will say something about that. Um, so uh, my own experience, and you mentioned before in the polyphony uh, a project that uh, headed by um, um, Nabila Budishka in uh, Nazareth were musicians from uh, uh, as instrumentalists in this case, uh, from uh, part of them uh, Jewish Israelis, um, part of them uh, 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 Palestinian Israelis. Uh, they were playing together for weekends, uh, working on, on classical music in that case. And, but th that unto itself was a very, very nice experience. They were very good musicians and they did music together. But our idea was that in order to make it into some sort of lasting not just experience, but knowledge, for speaking of, of cognition, is to bring it within a context of, uh, I would say, kind of civic epistemology. That's Yoron Ezrahi, my, my husband, a uh, professor of uh, political science, used to call it uh, uh, civic epistemology. That is, and um, to show where these works uh, uh, um, emerged and why, and in relation to what ideas, for example, in, in politics, 
uh, uh, and in uh, relation to human rights and, and things which music is indeed connected with, that, that music. And we had really wonderful seminars with all sorts of discussions and uh, reading real texts. Students, they have to come, had to come, not just uh, with uh, preparing themselves to the music, but also to reading the texts that they were supposed to read. And in that way, we created also a continuity from one seminar to the other. So the idea is that if you want to create something that use it, it will work with its good ideational context, that's what I want to say. And it's true also of, of for community. Maybe I'll say that and then uh, I, I will stop. Uh, because community is a different sort of concept and this different sort of um, experience and social medium, let's say. Uh, Choirs are great, these uh, kind of ensembles are wonderful, but we are somehow living, I think, in the, in, uh, the last decades, communities, as what I call vocal communities. Communities are not singing anymore, if there are communities anymore. And, and kids, as such, are not singing. I know it about my own grandchildren, that in school they are not singing, we used 50 years ago, I'm, I'm speaking about 50 years ago, we used to sing, sing in, in school and used to, to sing in the youth movement. And so we were part of a, com of a singing community to enjoy the, this kind of simultaneity of that any, no other medium uh, can enjoy in that way. And we created this cohesive uh, togetherness through singing and sound and the text and all that which relates to it. And unfortunately, this has been greatly deteriorating in, in the last decades. And so, first of all, we are somehow preventing from kids of all sorts, not, not only the very musical ones, the uh, kind of exposure, the need in order to be active in music, not just kind of passive listeners, and to be active is part of this. And then within a community, to have it with an entire life of a community. It's very clear with regard to religious communities. But the question is what we are doing with communities which are not religious anymore and lack this kind of common denominator. So this is something that to think about. I would like to stop here and perhaps to continue to develop these ideas later on. Edwin, now you're on mute. <laughs> Nika, please. That's all what I said. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I, I will. <laughs> um, so, Ruth, I'm I'm trying to remember. So that what you were saying second was about sort of the distinction between choirs as like performing ensembles, for example, and then sort of singing communities that are really open to everyone. Um, and are more ubiquitous in like daily life. You don't have to like go to chorus rehearsal to you know sing with people on the street. Um, I'll start there um, and 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 say that a lot of my training actually and my worldview about singing and music is very much oriented towards this idea that singing is a human right. Um, that there is a, a way that like our voices are just a fundamental part of who we are. And there's so much in society that sort of tells us to shut up and listen. Um, and that that's fundamentally harmful to humans ability to just be human, not even just to like be musicians or to be performers, but just to be human. Um, and one of the things, uh, one of my mentors in that regard is Isai Barnwell, um, who was a bass with Sweet Honey in the Rock for many years and leads Community Sings and developed sort of a practice um, and, a, and a methodology basically around getting people, getting random people who are quote unquote untrained and maybe have never met before to uh, be comfortable singing together multi-part harmony in the oral tradition on the spot. Um, and, and so I learned from her how to lead community sing sort of in her way. And that has deeply informed all of the musical efforts that, that I undertake. And even in our, in our chorus concerts with the Jerusalem Youth Chorus, 
in almost every concert, we then turn the mic on the audience and teach the audience a song in multi-part harmony on the spot. Um, and it's this sort of assertion that actually singing is can be for everyone and that this sort of artificial distinction between either you're a professional performer or you're a silent audience member is actually harmful. Um, so I, I agree that um, different efforts to bring just a sense of singing as something that people do because they're people back into uh, society can be very helpful. Um, and perhaps um, maybe an op obviously it's the challenge, right? To if we're trying to create sort of different uh, uh, different parameters for community and maybe who's defined as us and them and how we can create sort of common musical language um, for folks who aren't just like in a particular ensemble, but are just like living in daily life in different communities um, or different cities or different uh, uh, religious groups or whatever it is. Um, a, it's a challenge that people aren't singing as much, right? Because we don't have as fertile ground necessarily to just insert a different song into an already sort of singing uh, place. And I'd offer that maybe there's an opportunity there as well to if, you know, if we're trying to bring sort of musical community building and cohesion as something that is needed because it's actually not there as much anymore and folks may recognize its, its lack and, and sort of how necessary it is, maybe then there's an opportunity in a more sort of blank canvas kind of way to say, you know what, and we should actually be singing things that can actually bring everybody in. So that's sort of my, my thinking about, about that. Um, it's a challenge and an opportunity. Um, and I, your earlier points, Ruth, about the uh, context of music and not just sort of making music for, you know, art for art's sake and then going home is extremely central also to uh, the way that we work in the Jerusalem Youth Chorus and to everything that I do. Um, as a musician, um, because particularly when working in a context as easy to do harm as working with Israelis and Palestinians, um, if you're just thinking like, yeah, we're just going to like sing together and go home, like in my mind, you're kind of part of the problem. Um, because there is so much work, like music is an opening. Music is an opportunity to connect but then you need to go deeper than that. Like, and, and in the Jerusalem Youth Chorus, we have a facilitated dialogue program that goes into, I, I love the way you were talking about um, your civic epistemology. I've never heard that term before, but it really resonates with what we try to do in the Jerusalem Youth Chorus as well in terms of, we think about it in terms of creating a value language and understanding um, like social structuring and the way that realities and narratives are constructed and the ways that maybe we are taught not to question things that maybe we should question and also providing some solid foundation in terms of understanding what a value like equality means in different contexts and that there are different types of equality and like maybe some are better over here and some are better over there. And like, what about in school? What about in my neighborhood? What about in the chorus? Um, and then how does equality match up against freedom? Like we also like freedom, but like you can't always have both. And so, like, you know, and like those are discussions on both internal chorus levels, inter intra community levels and inter community levels that happen in our rehearsals every week. Um, and the songs that we sing are injected as jumping off points into those discussions and are framed um, also in our performances in a way that also brings some of that dialogue process into the audience's experience as well. We're not just like singing a program with a bunch of program notes that nobody reads about like the composer's life or whatever and then saying we made a difference like we're actually talking about why these songs matter um and doing so in most of our concerts in three languages 
Um, and all of our rehearsals are translated into, into three languages so everyone can understand. There's no common language requirement and that is our attitude for musical language as well. Um, and so I, um, I agree again, surprise Ruth with, uh, with everything that you said. And, um, you know, we've been sort of tinkering around with like how to, how to do it in the best way that we can. Uh, Mika, I, uh, I really like, um, uh, your idea, uh, as to what the singing community is in the sense that what Ruth was referring uh, before, we are usually uh, talking about singing communities that were uniform uh, in in any uh, in any term uh, usually the most common places where you could use your voice and and, and make uh, your own statement of belief was on religious settings that is church choirs synagogue choirs etc uh, uh, we are talking now about a totally different ball game that is to say choirs actually where people have not uh, anything in common, whether this is a belief or uh, even if you're uh, voicing your, your voice in a great uh, choir in a, a football uh, uh, stadium, uh, you're still a participant in a community that uh, certainly you sing with your team. So what happens uh, uh, when you don't uh, sing with, uh, with an homogeneous uh, socially or religiously or ethnically homogeneous community? That's, uh, that's the big uh, challenge. And finally, uh, before we also move into uh, letting uh, uh, all the other participants in the symposium to, to make their voice being heard, uh, I am a violinist and I would like to just ask uh, briefly whether you have uh, anything to say regarding the issue of uh, vocal music versus instrumental music as, uh, as a... Um, uh, venue for uh, forging the ideals that uh, we are trying to advance in the sense that vocal music always, as you just mentioned, Mika, has the issue of text and text is already a different level of signification, whether the language itself or the, the limitations of the language itself or the content of the text that can be problematic, whereas instrumental music is, so to speak, neutral and offers because of other paces and we have had in the Middle East many attempts uh, to use both instrumental and vocal music uh, as uh, venues for creating spaces for uh, dialogue and, and forging a certain, uh, at least the minimum sense of empathy that we can um, achieve in the present uh, day uh, political uh, atmosphere. So um, these two points, and then uh, we will open the floor to the public, please. To relate to this, and uh, first, uh, Micha, it was really wonderful to hear you, and I'd like to uh, refer to what you said uh, in terms of how informed, how well informed a leader of, of a musical body like yours should be in order to good to do very good work uh, that you are doing. It's not it's not enough to be very good musician. You have to be much more informed in order to do the, the work. Having said that, I would like to refer to what you said, uh, Edwin, and about the difference between the uh, instrumental uh, versus uh, vocal music. Uh, there is another element that. I, th I think a musical leader should should be should, should be part of his mental frame, so to speak, and this is indeed the emotional elements that are part of the music that that group is making. Uh, the emotion, as we know, this is since this is a, uh, a symposium about cognition, music cognition. We're not quite well now through semiotics, through musical cognition, through other. Uh, um, with uh, some disciplines, something about the, the actual content, uh, emotional content of certain music, uh, and of course it changes from one culture to the other. Now, when a teacher or a leader is introducing the music to uh, his uh, or her kids, or those members of the community and so on, she must uh, be aware of these contents and to 
make it accessible to those members, to show them what it is, to, to uh, point to the mode in which it's written, to the kind of motifs, to, to what makes it somehow dialogical or all kinds of other musical elements, musical contents that are related to uh, the emotional uh, import of that music. Since, since you, you mentioned in the beginning the, the whole question of empathy, it works only when we can read the other's uh, emotional expression. If we cannot do that, so no empathy will work. That's the first thing, and, and all those who are, uh, are discussing it from the point of view of our mirror cells and all the other things, is to be able to identify it. Identifying it is part of education. You cannot just, it's not universal the way that once people thought. There are universal elements in it, but, but in the final analysis, they are all constructed within cultural schemes of sorts. So, yeah. And so what I would like to emphasize is that you have to negotiate it to those musicians in order to also help them bring out those emotional elements in their own singing, in their own music. That's for now. I, I agree, as usual. Um, and I, I think that that's one of the big challenges and opportunities in doing this work also is to really create opportunities for people to learn the other musical cultures that are in whatever group or community you're trying to create on their own terms as well. So like not just saying, uh, okay, well, we're all going to do music of this kind and people who come from that music culture have a leg up and that's just the way it is. Um, which is extremely hard to do in practice. Um, particularly given that we're dealing with vastly different musical backgrounds in our group. Um, and we're still trying to figure out like the right you know, formula and the right different contexts and the right ways that everyone can be heard in their own way, um, in a way that's also coherent and in a way where people in the group can actually react to and understand to some degree the music that is happening in a completely different style than the one that they are accustomed to or grew up in. Um, and um, it's yeah, it's it's a it's a big challenge. I would I would also you know agree, Edwin, with what you said that you know obviously once you add words, it's like a whole nother level of complex signification. And I would say at the same time that even with instrumental music, you still got plenty of cultural signification um, in in the ways that uh, that uh, Ruth was saying and. Um, that it, you know, it's often, uh, you know, the groups that ignore that, that in my mind are the most sort of unfair. Um, where like, and, and usually use Western classical music. <laughs> so um, I think that those, uh, I didn't, those. I to say that. <laughs> I'm, hey, I'm going to go there. Yeah. I'm going to go there. Yeah, That's, yeah. yeah. That's, um, I think there, there's an arrogance that comes from the world and the sort of ideology of Western classical music that somehow it is universal, which is a lie, and that somehow it is better than all other types of music, which is also a lie. It is one of many types of music and one beautiful way of making music out of many other beautiful ways of making music. And I would argue, um, you know, if we're talking about universality, the music that in today's world has the closest shot of being called universal is pop music, which classical musicians, generally speaking, who adhere to that ideology would be very sad about. Um, so I, I would say that I'm not advocating that all music become pop music, because I think there's a lot of richness and a lot of depth and a lot of specificity that is a beautiful part of the process of really learning how to musically celebrate difference, um, which is what we try to do in the chorus. That would be lost if everything just becomes Call Me Maybe. Um, and 
at the same time, uh, there are a lot of uh, assumptions that many of us have that come also from like training that we've received. I can say as someone who, you know, has a music degree, like from, from Yale, like I was, you know, the, what I, I had to unlearn a lot of what I learned in college about music in order to really do the work that I'm doing, I can say. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah that's, I, I agree. Uh, that's uh, absolutely uh, truth. And uh, we have to add uh, to that that uh, uh, to play a musical instrument, simply you need um, training, it's a basic training. Uh, in a way, uh, uh, whereas your voice is your most natural uh, uh, instrument that can be used, uh, uh, no matter what uh, what training uh, do you have, you can sing no matter what. Yeah. Uh, let me tell you that uh, um, my own experience of many, many years uh, through uh, an initiative called the Mediterranean Musical Dialogue, uh, uh, was to show that at least uh, the instrumental music uh, from Morocco to the end of Persia and even Western China shares uh, enough, um, I would say, uh, basic uh, characteristics that uh, can allow for a very diversified dialogue. And I think that this uh, idea in the Middle East uh, uh, has really caught and the developments of the past 20, 30 years in terms of instrumental music and uh, playing together of people from different backgrounds and, and uh, religions and ethnic groups uh, has been uh, very successful. As I hinted before, uh, sometimes uh, uh, political, the changing of political winds uh, affect this type of projects. But uh, we have to, to have faith in instrumental music too, uh, can do the work, particularly in, uh, in uh, music uh, of, uh, of the Mediterranean area or of the greater Middle East, or as, you know, as I called it, the music of the Islamicate, that is to say, to the world of Islam in its wider sense, that uh, were improvisation and dialogue through musical improvisation is uh, such an uh, such a uh, how to say such an incredible methodology for allowing individual voices to be heard within the framework of a collective that's something that regretfully western music forgot we know that there was a lot of improvisation in western music in earlier periods and we sort of gave up uh, that uh, aspect of uh, music making, which methodologically can be very useful for, for our purposes. I want to open the floor. We have uh, 10 minutes uh, left. If uh, someone wants to even come up into the stage uh, of the symposium and uh, be heard with your voice uh, and, uh, and your face, but uh, you don't have to, you can also uh, send us uh, through the chat. So if someone out there uh, wants to intervene and uh, whether ask a question or just give your opinion about what was said uh, we will uh, really appreciate it let's see what if we have any uh, reactions maybe in the meantime i will say something yes but yes. if I, uh, I would be ready to stop. Yeah. Yeah, one second. Uh, Sarah, do you want to say something or? Oh. Okay, uh, Ruth, please go ahead. Please, please. So I want to say that since I started with all the negative elements, I want to say something positive about our time. It is related to what you said beforehand, Edwin, about uh, the change that uh, uh, we uh, we witnessed uh, through, and I would like to make it the history much wider in a way and to say that in the beginning of the 20th century music singing together music had a, a tremendous in, in, uh, import importance in creating those uh, cohesive groups of youth movements and it was the first who were aware of that where the the germans in the with the uh, van der Vögel, uh that uh, um then inspired many other youth movements, also the, the Zionist ones and uh, many others in, in Eastern Europe and so on. And later on, of course, 
the, the Hitler youth, yeah, the, the Hitler Jugend, that without this basis of singing together, it wouldn't have been co cohered in, in the way that we, we knew it later on. The, the, the role of music was so important. And now you pointed, Edwin, to the fact that uh, now, nowadays we have less of this sort of um, solid, solid, solidarity uh, sort of vocal communities. We, we have more uh, means as well as ways to organize choirs like the, the, the kind that you have, uh, Micha, and that we have also the Rena Choir in, in Jaffa of women, uh, Arab and Israeli women, and there are many others. So the diversity can play as such such an important role uh, to create a new kind of solidarity, solidarity which is beyond the, the group uh, to, where, to which you were born or you are identifying with uh, more naturally. And so that is, uh, is a great advantage and it's not used enough, I'm afraid. But since in ev everywhere, in every city in the world today, big city, you have all this multiculturalism uh, there, and just to bring the, the, the kids, the people together and to create so it's something is, is much more uh, possible than in the past. Thank you very much, uh, Ruth. I wanted to wrap, but we have a question and, uh, and, and also a participant who wants to intervene. So first, a question by uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Phillips. Uh, how do you recommend young people get involved in musical endeavors for conflict resolution or cultural, cultural heritage preservation? Starting organizations such as Mika's Choir is something many of us may be interested in. It probably requires a decent amount of funding. What uh, other actions are there and how do you, we get financial support? Mika, please. Sure, Elizabeth, thank you uh, for that question. And I can say um, for my own uh, journey that when I started the chorus, you know, I had some seed funding, but sort of a lot of faith that somehow it would work out. Um, and many people are not able to take that leap of faith and do not have the sort of uh, financial safety net that I, I had when going to Jerusalem that like if it failed, then it would fail and I would be fine. You know, like that th that is not something that most people can do and most people don't have access to like a graduating senior fellowship from college to pay for them to go a year and try to do something crazy like what I was doing. Um, so I want to acknowledge that. Um, I would say that um, there are ways to join and support existing efforts um, without necessarily needing to start a new one. Um, and I would say that the most important starting point would be to really do your research um, and to, to learn about what is out there and what has worked and what has not worked. And maybe if there's you know, uh, language involved in the culture that you're interested in, learn it. You know, if there's a musical language involved in the culture that you're interested in, learn it. Um, there are a lot of folks who try to come and have really great intentions and often really great ideas, but don't know the context that they're getting into. And a lot of those contexts not only fail, but as you were saying also, Ruth, like can do harm. Um, and and cost a lot of money and time and, and emotional cost and all kinds of other things and cost the reputation of organizations like the Jerusalem Youth Chorus that are actually trying to do our homework. Yeah. Um, and so I would say really do your homework first and in that pro and I'd say do your homework and reach out unabashedly to people who are doing awesome work that you want to learn from and see if you can learn from them and or um, help them in some way. Um, for me, having that mentorship and doing that research and actually learning and studying Hebrew and Arabic and music of Israeli and Palestinian cultures, and then ultimately writing my senior thesis on like, can you do this, then provided me the foundation to then actually try to do it. Um, so it's, yeah. it's important to acknowledge sort of what came before that. Thank you, Mika. Uh, I would ask. I would also add that uh, there are several very generous foundations 
that are really looking sometimes after projects like this. They have the money and they don't know that we have the ideas. So linking the ideas to the money is also important. Avi Gilboa, please come up. Avi? I think Rory is making him a host so he can come on stage. Yes, yes, yes. Just you have to come up on stage. Yeah, there's a button that says like, come up on stage or whatever yeah. it says exactly. Yes, exactly. Once you're given the opportunity, you'll get the button. You should be able now, David, uh, Avi. The button is near the bottom, near the microphone and video camera buttons. Abby, if not, please uh, just write your question in the chat and I will read it. This is a very robust and very complicated conference platform, I can yeah, say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's excellent, but we should have a pre-conference training. Train, training camp. Absolutely. Where, where, Absolutely. where we could sing to sing together I was all just the rules. Say, yeah. Exactly. Well, until Avi comes up, I just wanted to say that uh, the Corona period also taught us that we there are, of course, the singing or even playing communities um, uh, together online. That the technology of uh, the ability of singing uh, together, which even uh, two years ago was. Uh, imaginary now it's uh, it's quite a reality that is the sync is uh, getting so good that uh, a lot can be done uh, today uh, as we have seen in so many projects during the past year and a half of people from all around the world that share a common uh, uh, musical uh, interest whether stylistic or genre uh, that they can uh, make uh, uh, music together of course providing again we go back to economics that they have the technological means and the tools to uh, to be able to enter uh, uh, so Avi writes I just wanted to say how much I admire Mika's work so Mika you you got your compliment it's much more complicated than it seems if I could get up on stage I would explain why and Avi you are able to get on stage but I don't know why you uh, cannot and uh, we are uh, running uh, out of time. So may I suggest uh, the following. Uh, tomorrow we have a second round of, uh, of the One World in Song uh, symposium and I invite everybody to come and uh, we will uh, certainly uh, open the floor for more interventions regarding the Middle East, even though the panel of tomorrow is dedicated to uh, the Americas and, and Europe. So we really don't have to uh, be so uh, limited in terms of geography, and we can continue uh, this conversation uh, tomorrow. Uh, for the sake of the conference, uh, I want to uh, end on time, right on time. I would like to thank Professor Ruta Cohen uh, and uh, Mika Handler uh, for, uh, I hope, very, very soon in the future, Dr. Mika Handler. Uh, I <laughs> hope uh, that you will uh, uh, turn also to academia a little bit and uh, join us. Uh, you're invited. And I uh, thank all the public and all uh, uh, our uh, colleagues uh, who left very nice um, uh, me messages in the in the chat and all those hands that you saw rising up on yeah the, we got even which, we got even some like yeah, fire we got yeah we got uh, we, we <laughs> got uh, yeah it's uh, an amazing uh, feature of this uh, program cool. so thank you very much very cool and uh, we'll see you tomorrow the same time and the same place. Now we know the time. Now we so know the time. <laughs> yeah, so we will be right there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the technical uh, assistance too that they made this uh, work and, and possible. Thank you very much. And thank you to David Greenberg once again for the for initiative and the organization. Thank you very much. And thank you, Thanks Edwin, for hosting. And, and uh, would, would you take me to your uh, choir? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, my God. You are so invited. Yeah. Well... <laughs>
I am <laughs> even be, I am be, I am even better because I am a tenor. There is always a lack of tenors. We in the need choir. tenors. You already know. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.